nearly three year training uh, at the Royal London Hospital. And I'm going to do a whistle stop tour through uh, open fractures. So the aims of this talk are to understand the pathology of the injury and give everybody a, a basic idea of the immediate and the surgical management of the injury. So it's always good to start with a case, and I'm sure this will be familiar to a lot of people. So you've got a 43-year-old male in a motorcycle crash at 45 miles an hour, and he's been thrown off his bike 10 metres down the road. You're the on-call registrar at your major trauma centre, and your uh, major trauma bleak goes. The ambulance is 10, 10 minutes away, and you've been informed there's an open mid-shaft tibia fracture. So I'm sure lots of you are sort of familiar with this sort of presentation. And it's also a classic sort of uh, registrar interview question. Okay. So what is an open fracture? Sounds pretty obvious. It's, it's an open fracture is defined as a fracture that has an associated break in the skin, which is capable of communicating with the fracture and or its hematoma. And if you all go back to your uh, AO interpretation of fractures being a soft tissue injury, this is obviously an extreme soft tissue injury and needs to be treated as such. So a bit of history, uh, if you go back to the 1800s, um, a open fracture was considered fatal in a lot of cases and surgeons at the time knew that gangrene and sepsis were so common in open fractures that the only treatment that was potentially to save your life would be an amputation. And that was true until the mid 1800s where Mr. Lister came along and he was almost one of the godfathers of asepsis. And he treated a seven year old with an open tibia fracture by placing a phenol soaked rag over the wound and came back in five days time to find that no gangrene had set in. And then he came back in four weeks time to find not only the wound healed, uh, but the, the child had gone on to the union. So he then uh, treated more fractures like this and published his results in The Lancet, where he managed to reduce his infection rate with open fractures by over 50 percent. And despite huge advances since then, unfortunately, open fractures still uh, are a huge source of morbidity and disability um, following traumatic injuries. So what are the pathology of an open fractures? Relatively simple, it's a, a huge force through a wound which is causing the bone to break and the skin to open. People do classify them differently. So there's high energy open fractures, um, obviously things like your car accidents and your uh, wounds or your gunshot wounds. And there's also a category that's called low energy where people fall from standing and the sharp bone end will pierce the skin causing the fracture to be open. And the amount of energy that causes the fracture um, is also corresponds to the, uh, the damage to the soft tissues around it. And you may also hear some people talk about inside out and outside in fractures and that defines kind of what broke the skin. Was it the bones from the inside coming out and back in? Or was it from the outside, something like a, I don't know, a, machine, a weapon breaking the skin and then going on to fracture the bone? Now, wh whatever people explain it when they explain it like this, it's kind of fairly academic because at one point during the injury, the bone ends were outside the soft tissue envelope and obviously exposed to all the bacteria and the dirt and the grime that's in the world and then went back in. So um, it, whether it's described like that doesn't really matter. It's slightly academic because you're going to treat them all uh, in the same sort of way. So a bit of stats about the injuries. The average patient we see is a, a male in his 40s. The, the finger is the most common site, followed by the tibia and the ankle, uh, and then finally followed by the wrist. Um, and then uh, worked by a lot of the, the, the guys up in Edinburgh reports the most common injury for an open fracture is a crush fracture, followed by a fall from standing and then finally a road traffic collision. So what are your basic principles? So, you know, how do we treat these open fractures? What are our goals? Well, number one is to optimise limb function as best we can. And then number two is to avoid serious complications. And the big one we worry about is infection. And obviously we want to, at the end of the day, avoid having to amputate the limb down the line. So you're that on call reg, the patients come in, you're getting ready to go down and, and see the patient and in your head you're running through what, you know, what fantastic limb saving treatments you're going to do. But don't forget that these are high energy injuries and this is a classic mistake to make if you do, if you have got your interview upcoming. The most important principle is your ATLS management. This guy is often involved in a high energy injury and saving life is the first priority. Okay. Now, your ortho treatment wants to start as soon as possible. You are slightly against the clock with these things, and then we'll discuss that later. But you've got to be realistic and you've got to practically, you know, work out how you're going to treat your injury. Because before you can go about reducing your fracture and doing everything else you need to do, your patient needs to be stable. You need to have had some imaging 
and the patient needs to be sedated so they're not in pain and all of this takes quite a lot of coordination with lots of other teams so while our treatment is hugely important you've just got to remember to prioritize things and work with your colleagues to make it an efficient treatment okay other point is just to recognize in the immediate treatment the mechanism of injury is really important because from the mechanism of injury you can work out the amount of energy and also what the open fracture was in and we'll go on to that about a little bit later about infection and then two little learning points that I've just put in from, you know, just to don't fall into these pitfalls. If you have a high energy injury to a limb, a thorough examination is warranted. And that means circumferentially missing an open fracture is a, is a big no, no. So make sure you look all the way around the limb, even if it's been reported as closed. And finally, an open fracture doesn't exclude compartment syndrome, which uh, Pierre will be talking about later. So the patient's been stabilized. You're happy with your primary survey. He's you know, life has been saved. And it's now over to you to sort out the open fracture. And you're going to be hugely guided by your BOST guidelines. OK, so this is like your Bible. And generally speaking, uh, you can break it up into the immediate treatment and then the surgical treatment. And I'm just going to go through a, a couple of the points with you. OK, so number one, these BOST guidelines, if you buy the book, they only apply to long bones, hind foot or mid foot. But Practically, if the other in if there are other areas of the body that have an open fracture, you can use these guidelines to guide your treatment anyways. If it is the long bone, the hind foot or the midfoot, they need to go to the trauma centre and they don't even need to realistically be discussed. It should come straight to your A&E department for treatment. Anywhere else, it should be discussed with a senior decision maker. But if there's any concerns in a district general hospital about soft tissue injury or vascular injury, they're going to be coming across to the major trauma centre because that's where the plastic surgeons are, the vascular surgeons. Antibiotics should be uh, administered within one hour. OK, if you're lucky they, and the hems have been there, you might find they've given them at the scene or these advanced practitioners sometimes give them at the scene. But don't assume that. Make sure you are on hand and check when antibiotics have been given. You'll read in some of the journals, especially the American journals, that depending on the level of energy of injury, you should give a cephalosporin or a cephalosporin plus a, an amino glycoside. Again, realistically, it's slightly academic in, in the UK. You should just be following your local guidelines. And if the patient has fallen over in something that is particularly a high risk of infection, so sewage or seawater, it's always worth giving your microbiologist a call just to see if there's anything else they would add in. OK, also, don't forget tetanus. Uh, patients might need their tetanus boosters in, in, in full honesty I can't actually ever remember the tetanus guidelines right off the top of my head I always have to google it um, but you look at essentially the risk of tetanus from the injury and then also their immunis immunization status and you either give them a booster or you uh, can give them immuno um, IgG or they don't need anything at all. So the injured limb needs to be fully assessed, OK, and that includes a thorough documentation of vascular and neurological status, OK. With an open fracture, it is not acceptable to put a neurovascular intact. You need to very accurately document what nerves you've assessed, OK, and also what arteries as well. Now, I'm not going to touch too much about arterial injuries because Mr. Vaz already talking about it later, but just quickly going to say that in an open fracture, if you can't feel a pulse, you can't just write capillary refill time two seconds and leave it at that. These are really high energy injuries and you've got to have a high index of suspicion for vascular injury. So you need, if you can't feel a pulse, you need to be getting a Doppler scanner out to try and hear a pulse or getting a CT angio to look at the patency of the vessels. Okay. Patients who have uh, major trauma we're all going to go for a CT scan okay and I mentioned CT angio earlier one of the tips I learned when I started as, as an ST fit the Royal London is get on good uh, sort of terms with your radiologists and, and the radiographers in A&E and also the A&E consultants it's, it's a real waste of time sending the patient to the scanner twice so if they have a nasty open ankle fracture liaise with them and try and get it all in one scan because it saves yourself a lot of time and if you ask nicely again they can sort out CT angio as well so you've got all that information really readily available to you. Once they've had their, their imaging and they're stable, it's then over to you to reduce the, reduce the fracture and sort of treat it. But what I, you know, I'm going to encourage everybody to learn from my mistake, okay, that a lot of things have to happen for you to reduce your fracture and you look very amateur if you haven't prepared properly. So when your patient's having this trauma CT scan, get everything you think you might need ready. Do a little run through. What are you going to do? Because once the patient's out and you're going to try and reduce this fracture, if they're sedated and the plaster of Paris trolley isn't ready or you haven't got the right dressings, you just don't look very good. So do a little run through and make sure you've got everything on hand and ready to go. And once everybody's happy, the patient's stable, you've got some sort of sedation on him, you're going to then uh, first of all take off all the dressings, remove all the splints, and you're going to have a look at the wound. You're going to remove any gross debris, so anything that's really obviously sticking out, but you're not going to do a washout. You're going to take a photo of the wound 
before reducing it. By reducing it, you're just going to make sure the bones go back inside the soft tissue envelope. And you're not going to worry too much about getting a perfect reduction. You just want to get the limb out to length to protect the soft tissues. Um, and then you're going to splint it there. Once you've done your uh, reduction, you're then going to document again the neurovascular status afterwards um, before prepping for theatre the next day. So surgical treatment. So that's the immediate treatment done. Fantastic. You prepped him. You're going to get him on the on the operating list. Now this is over to the surgical treatment. So what are the, the timings of uh, open fractures? Well, if a patient falls over in something that's a high risk of infection, so sewage or seawater or farmyard, it is immediate. So you should be liaising with your CPOD theatres or your emergency theatres. I need to get this patient to theatre as soon as possible. If it's a high energy injury, it's within 12 hours. And if it's a low energy injury, within 24 hours. So what does that mean sort of practically? Well, if you get a high energy injury in the, in the morning, you should be trying to free up some space on your trauma theatres in the afternoon to get it done if possible. And if anything comes in overnight, realistically, you're going to be trying to put it on that morning operating list the next day. All of your surgery needs to be an orthoplastics approach, so an MDT approach. So what does that mean? Well, in our trust, it means that at the first debridement, there needs to be a senior plastic surgical decision maker in theatre with you to help you assess uh, the wounds. Now, why do we do this? There is no point fixing a fracture and putting all your metal work in if you can't get the soft tissues to close. Um, and often the damage underneath the skin can be a lot more extensive than you think. OK, so you need plastics there to work out whether they are happy that you're going to get soft tissue coverage and whether they and if they are going to get soft tissue coverage. Sorry, if you can't get soft tissue coverage, what are you going to do next? So you're then going to have to do a stage procedure, which might involve an X fix. It might involve a vac. OK, which is why you need plastics there to be liaising with them at all times. OK, if it is a stage procedure, you want to then also talk to them about how you, where your incisions are going to be, where your approaches is going to be, because you don't want to be um, putting an incision through a piece of skin that they might then want to use for a flap later. OK, so it's really worthwhile just having a bit of knowledge of, of plastic surgery. And, and I've put the plastic surgery sort of soft tissue coverage ladder on the side there. And uh, it's really good just to have a good knowledge of that. So you're happy, you've had your, you've done your an initial review with plastics and they've decided it's, it should be easily closed and you're off to fix your open tibia fracture. Okay, so what next? Well, the, the big thing that I learned being an ST3 is learn how to prepare for an open fracture. You need to prepare theatre for an open fracture. You need a huge amount of kit. Now I'm really lucky in the Royal London in that all of the scrub teams at the Royal London are very used to open fractures. So they just get everything ready and they know what to expect and they've always got backup and it's great. If you're doing this though overnight with a theatre team you're not used to, or if you're doing this maybe in a hospital that's not that used to open fractures, it's up to you to make sure you've got everything. So, you know, you're going to need six, you know, six to nine litres of water to wash your wound down. You're going to need a bag to collect that in. You're going to need your plan A for fixation. You're going to need your X fix on standby. You're going to need your VAC on standby. You might need to move the patient after you've done your washout and debridement. You might need to remove and readjust the patient. You're going to need two sets of surgical kit and you need to just have all this going in the back of your head that you need this already. Next, you're going to do your debridement. Now, I put this uh, in bold because I think it's one of the most important things of surgery. Okay, You've got to extend your, your wound, you've got to extend the incision, and you're going to try and do that in line with the fasciotomy lines because that gives you a nice reconstruction. Um, and then everything that is non-viable must come out, okay? And you need to be quite confident in just chopping away the stuff that is, is, is non-viable. And remember your C's of viable tissue. So it's got to be uh, capacity to bleed, the colour and contractile. So you're going to debride away everything that's dead. Once you're happy with it, you've got a really good, nice margin of healthy tissue. You're then going to deliver your bone ends into the wound so you can see them. You're going to use a curette to clear the bottom of the bone wound. Once you're happy, you've got all the grub and the dirt and the mud and the tree out. You're going to then do a big thorough washout. And it's, I mean, one of the papers that we'll talk about later said it's about three litres per Castillo Anderson rating. But broadly speaking, you're going to be doing at least five, six litres of washout. Once you've done your washout, you're then going to do, um, it's then a clean surgery. So you should redrape, you should put some fresh gloves on, fresh surgical kit, and then fix the fracture as you would normally. 
I'm slightly wary of time, so we're just going to motor through the next bit. So the bit, the obvious complication we are most worried about is infection, and there are new BOST guidelines um, of fracture-related infection uh, that is really worth reading. Um, osteomyelitis, septic arthritis are all sort of included in that, and also the amount of energy, uh, so the amount of soft tissue damage correlates to your chances uh, of an infection moving forwards. The other ones are the same with any surgery, so neurovascular injury, compartment syndrome, malunion, nonunion. So, um, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of trying to quote literature or, or learn things sort of verbatim, but uh, sort of if you're talking about relevant research and, and scoring systems, the Castillo Anderson is one of the kind of seminal papers that has really lasted the, the test of time. So it's really worthwhile. It's really interesting to read firstly, and it's also really worthwhile knowing sort of off by heart. So Castillo and Anderson in, in 1976, I think they looked uh, at about 500 open fractures, about I think 300 or so were retrospectively, and then they looked at the next 200 prospectively after they classified them and put different treatment plans in, in, in place for each one. Um, and they managed to half their infection rate and also the categories that they chose. So whether it's a type one, type two or type three was correlated to the outcome of infection rate. So it was a really useful tool that they used and you can see it there. So it is really worthwhile just knowing this because it means you can explain things easily to, to things at trauma meeting to, to your colleagues in trauma meeting. And broadly speaking, the greater the injury is correlated with the worst prognosis. Um, the diagnosis, just remember, is, it should be made at your first debridement, which is one of the only drawbacks of the score. Um, topics that are uh, quite relevant at the moment, there's lots of uh, research going into antibiotic impregnated devices. So you can get intramedullary nails that have got antibiotics on the outside, topical antibiotics. So you've got your vancomycin powders and your powders that we, and gentamicin powders that we put inside. It's got a lot of research going on, as well as different washing solutions and how we deliver that wash. So in summary, uh, remember that first comes your life-saving ATLS treatment. After that, you're going to it's over to you with your BOS guidelines. You're going to do your A&E treatment and make sure you get that perfect. And then your surgical treatment and the aims to salvage limb function and minimize the risk of complications. I was going to quickly talk through our case, but I've noticed I'm already running over. So I'm just going to end it there. Are there any questions?